It's really great to be here. It's really exciting, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, my name's Anthony. I'm the VP of Product Development at MakerBot. So I'm here to talk about Linux and 3D printing and how they're kind of similar and how they are going in, in directions and how they're a little bit connected and how hopefully um, the tools that you guys are working on, the tools that Linux provides, can help 3D printing grow into new and exciting directions. Uh, so before I start here, uh, what is MakerBot, right? So I like to describe MakerBot as a company that is trying to change the way people interact with things, with objects. And that might be physical objects in a lot of ways, but it's also the way that people manipulate and share and interact with the digital representation of those objects. And um, so the main way we do that today is by selling feature-rich, easy-to-use, relatively low-cost desktop 3D printers and the software that supports them. Um, th how we'll do that tomorrow, I think, is a little bit of what I want to talk about. So 3D printing is not new. It's not a new technology. It's been around for almost 30 years, and it's always had this kind of air of the exotic. It's got this mystical thing about it, because it's a magic box. It's a magic box that can produce any object, can produce anything. And that's why it kind of captures the imagination in this really profound and powerful way. And um, in the beginnings, you can see how, how a hacker and, and hobbyist and academic community could kind of channel those ideas into something, something more, right? To try to take it out of these half million dollar exotic things in a lab somewhere and make it something more tangible. And that's where you know, the RepRap project and a lot of the open source work in 3D printing kind of began in trying to demystify this magic and make it something that's accessible and, and reachable to everyone. And MakerBot took those ideas and, and, and ultimately turned them into products, right? And tried to make that even, even more accessible to people. And uh, in, the, in the early days, when things were, were literally made of plywood, um, we were able to see that there was kind of a nascent community, a nascent, there, there was a demand for an easier to use, more accessible 3D printer on the desktop. And the early MakerBots kind of showed that that demand was there. And um, th there were people who were looking for something that they could, they could touch and they could realize immediately. So, you know, as we moved up in our technology to the Replicator 2 and things that were a little bit more tangible, that weren't kits, that were made of wood, um, I think that kind of brought that accessibility to the next level. But, um, but why am I here? Why does this matter to the Linux community? What does this have to do with, with what you guys are doing? Uh, so first and foremost, MakerBot loves Linux. Um, this is the new fifth generation Replicator platform, all of which are built on embedded Linux, uh, the 3.8 mainline to be exact. And there's a lot of pretty obvious reasons for this, right? Uh, it's a profound improvement uh, in development time. So we were able to get these things to market so much faster. Linux has all the support for peripherals, networking, you guys know all this stuff, right? It's a huge change in, in scalability, maintainability, field upgradability. Um, embedded Linux is, is, you know, quite frankly, how products like this should be built. Further, all the, um, embedded, all the embedded development we've done with our team internally is based on open source tool chains. Our desktop application has, we're committed to Linux support. We support Ubuntu and Fedora. Uh, I don't know if Mr. Torvalds is in the room, but a, a funny story about that is uh, one of our devs read on Mr. Torvalds' blog that he was having trouble with his Fedora installation of MakerWare, and uh, he, the guy came in, worked through the weekends, through the nights to get Fedora up and running. So we have that, we have that happening now. Um, and finally, you know, we, we have Android support. We're committed to supporting that on all platforms. And as we build out our set of APIs, we want to really build them on open standards to make it easier for everyone to interact with our products. But m more significantly than the products just running Linux is this kind of ecosystem of our software platforms that, re that really live in the web and live on the cloud, right? The, we have a desktop app, we have mobile apps, we have tablet apps. We have the Thingiverse, which is our community that lets you share objects and share files and, and interact with them and remix them. And uh, we also have th this, this, cloud, this cloud library, which is, uh, allows people to upload their files and share them from any device across any platform. So what we're trying to do is build out an ecosystem here that is all connected and enabled by, by Linux devices, these Linux hardware devices that connect up into the cloud. So about Linux, um, I think Linux and 3D printing have a little bit of a, a shared lineage, right? Is that a very 
established platform was not accessible. An established technology was not available to the community. So a group of hobbyists and enthusiasts recognized that there was a need to bring this down to a more human level, to a more accessible level. Unix, you know, is 20 years old, and the, the Linux movement has really shown that, that accessibility, consistent tools, and a open community can really grow a platform faster than a closed system can. You know, price is obviously a big part of it too, right? Free as in beer doesn't hurt, but it, it leads to adoption, and adoption is pretty, pretty broad. The analysts are saying, you know, a billion installations of Linux this year across all these platforms, and the innovation is in accessibility. And that leads to, to a, a huge ecosystem of Linux products. So, you know, at the highest volume consumer handsets, you have the Android platform. In the hobbyist and educational space, you have things like Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone, which is opening up Linux to a whole new world of developers, you know, at the elementary school level, which is super exciting. Uh, then you have kind of the, a level below that, the more embedded use cases, things like Roku, Steambox, the set-top box, bring Linux into the living room, and then beyond that, the truly embedded, deeply embedded things like kiosks, slot machines, automotive, white box goods. And all of these platforms across the whole spectrum running Linux. How does something like this happen? It's accessibility, it's consistent tools, and it's a community. So I think 3D printing is kind of on a similar arc, right? We are, have this wide spectrum of 3D printers that, again, were built from this high-end technology that was not accessible, that was mystical, and the community of academics, hackers, hobbyists bring it down to a human level, and we're trying to, to kind of break it out into a, the widest, widest reach possible. And I think what's, what's important is that what, we, what we're realizing now is that a community at the education level, the elementary school level, high school, academic, colleges, small businesses, large businesses all have different needs for 3D printing, and a consistent set of tools will let them grow to maximum kind of market penetration, maximum accessibility in, in the broader world. And that's what's going to make 3D printing the true, the true disruptive technology that, that everyone alluded to. It's not about necessarily the hardware, it's about a connected set of tools that make it consistent. So if anyone has had any time playing around with 3D modeling tools, things like SketchUp or, or 123D Create, you see that it's not intuitive. It's not an intuitive product. If you put it in front of a child, it becomes, you know, they struggle just moving the camera around and trying to understand how this tool works in three dimensions. And what is going to have to be necessary to grow 3D printing into the wider audience is to make those tools easier to use. So we're working on things like parametric modeling tools, and we're opening up our APIs to allow a community of developers to create tools that use all different types of modeling, scanning, all these other ideas of creating that don't necessarily weigh heavily with these high-end CAD tools like SolidWorks and ProEngineer. So when you have a spectrum of hardware products, that let accessibility at every price point, we're well, gonna to need to build out a, a set of software products that support that in the same way. So that's what we're trying to build here at MakerBot, is a set of hardware products that are extensible, connected, enabled by embedded Linux, and connect that up with this broad set of applications, and then make those applications open to the broader world and the broader community. So I think that's the power of what Linux and the Linux community can bring to this, is the idea that sharing these hooks, these tools to the hardware will let people create and iterate on exciting new ideas. And I think that the explosion you saw in Linux hardware and Linux-based products is really analogous to what we'll see in 3D printing products in the coming years. And I think that explosion is going to be both hardware products at every entry point and software products on every platform. So I want to touch on a couple examples of how this is starting to play out in real life. Um, this is one of our, our first partner applications. It's a company called Modio. And they have used our API and our connection to Thingiverse and Cloud Library to create this non-modeling modeling tool. Um, it's kind of a goofy application. It's a, you know, an action figure maker, an action figure creator. 
uh, but it'll run on, on your tablet, or iOS or Android tablet, and it lets a child design the action figure of their dreams, and all the 3D printing parts kind of get abstracted away. So once you've designed your cool guy, it'll plate it for you, it'll handle all the slicing, it'll upload it to your cloud library. If you have a fifth generation printer, it'll transfer it seamlessly to your bot, you push a button, and out comes your thing. And so this is the kind of tool that's going to make 3D printing really widespread, right? And it's going to help blow out a whole new set of applications. So you can imagine as a developer, whatever kind of tie-ins or whatever kind of products that you're working on that could benefit from a physical realization could tie into the API and produce things. And hopefully this API will become larger than MakerBot. It will become connected to all internet-connected 3D printers. And we'll have a common backend that will allow app developers to create more powerful use cases and things that are beyond just action figure and, and toy creation. So it's, it's a very exciting idea. It captures the imagination. And it can have a lot of applications in, in really almost every space. So there's some cool action figure guys that we created. They're really, they're, it's really fun. It's a great toy. And uh, the products that come out of it are, are, are neat. So uh, another, on the other side of the spectrum is uh, a little bit more of a, a pragmatic use case with, with the same idea. Um, John, who's going to follow me up here, is going to really touch on this subject in depth. And uh, the idea of this project is called RoboHand, is a, a global distributed hardware development that was able to happen thanks to the Thingiverse. So uh, the story here is that uh, if anyone has children, right, their children are constantly outgrowing their shoes, outgrowing their clothes. So you can imagine with a high cost prosthetic, children are constantly outgrowing their prosthetics. And in the developing world, this is, becomes price prohibitive and a lot of people can't afford them. So an engineer in South Africa uh, developed a 3D printable prosthetic hand for children. And he uploaded the files to the Thingiverse, and he was able to kind of connect with a global community of biomedical engineers, mechanical designers, doctors. And what happened was this kind of rapid iteration of, of design kind of across the spectrum to, make, to improve the design and make it better and make it easier to assemble and make it easier to print and to share it out globally. And the, the beauty of this is it's the tools that are behind 3D printing. 3D printing is not really the enabling technology here. It's the sharing of the files. It's the sharing of the ideas. And it's allowing for this global, broader global development. Um, I think we have a lot of a long ways to go here. And I think John is going to talk about this a little bit more. But what we can do as a community is work to develop applications that make sharing and remixing and creating this kind of stuff easier than ever before. So, it's, it's a mix of the accessibility of the hardware in every platform plus the sharing. And kind of the, the degenerate example of this, kind of the, the biggest, broadest example, uh, a lot of you have probably seen the heart gear, sort of the classic 3D printed object. It's designed, designed by an uh, aerospace engineer out in, in Seattle. And um, it's sort of become an emblematic thing of 3D printing. It's a great fiddling toy with your nervous energy. But it's really a, an example of how remixing kind of plays itself out on a broader scale thanks to the tools that MakerBot provides. So the, the geared heart is not really the first or the last geared heart design that ever was, right? There was a, a designer in the, this is kind of showing the, the family tree, the lineage of the first geared objects and how they got remixed and rethought and shared and rebuilt into a broader community of objects. And, and now this is, this is really a subset of it. There's now hundreds of geared object designs that are based on this original. They have a, it's a family tree. And you, know, you have your geared Pikachu and your geared Mario head and your geared whatever. And it's, it's enabled people who don't necessarily have that you know, modeling skill to make this complex geared object to create it. So the, the, the powerful idea here is that objects now have this broader life, this bigger, more flexible existence than they had in the past. And this is analogous to software and how software, once it exists in the open source community, it can be shared, it can be remixed, it can be reworked, and its value is increased. So what I think MakerBot 
and, and share, these sharing tools will ultimately do is will increase the value of, of objects, will increase the utility of the things that people make by allowing everyone in the community to, to remix them and rethink them and improve on them. And I think this is gonna be the, the real innovation in 3D printing when it kind of really explodes. It's the idea that objects themselves are not, are not final. And I think that's, that's really a powerful idea. Um, it, of course, it opens up all the, the usual things that come with an open community, right? And copyright, and what happens when I'm remixing Mickey Mouse's head, and who's getting paid for that. And, and these are, I think, real problems that are gonna start to play out over the next few years. Um, but what's exciting about it is that these problems have largely been, it's not new this time around, right? It's not going through the same thing that we've gone through with music and movies and, and code. It's, there's a little bit of a blueprint for how this can work. And I'm really, really excited to see how this will play out on, on a global stage. So what's next? I don't really know. I think we're going to see a lot more 3D printers out in the wild of every brand and every type and open and closed source. And I think that's, that's really the goal here is to get this technology to a point where it's commonplace. Um, the, the remix and rethinking of objects and, and that is, I think, I think that's the big next step that's coming. And you know, when I talk to a lot of people about it, well, I don't, I don't need a machine that just makes plastic, plastic things. I don't need, I'm sick of plastic. I don't need more toys. And it's like, that's a very common criticism and a fair one. But the, the technology that you're seeing on the desktop right now is, is truly in its infancy. And the, st the level we're at is, is, is we're nowhere. The, the materials are going to come. The, the connectivity is going to come. The features, the speed, all the, all the criticisms that people have of, of desktop 3D printing today are 100% fair. But it's just like computing. It's just like any other technology is that we are in its infancy. And the growth rate is going to get exponential very soon. It's all been enabled by this, this underlying technology, and that, that uh, Linux is a, a huge part of that technology. So I guess in closing, I'm, I'm excited to see what everyone makes here, and I, I hope people can take one thing away from this, is that an open and connected API for 3D printing and for objects is coming. And I think a lot of the ideas of the Linux community and the open source community can really harness that power and hopefully use it to create tools that let people make new and exciting things in, in every industry. So uh, I'm gonna be around. I, I look forward to talking to people who wanna talk more about this. And uh, thank you so much for having me.